Thank you, I feel very welcomed. I'm talking about uh, computing platforms for the 21st century. I mean, traditionally speaking, a computer platform is something like a, a PC or a mainframe machine. Um, and certainly it's only recently that the idea of them occurring in portable devices like your Android or iPhone. Now, it's market that provide the opportunities and businesses um, are very much opportunity driven. So here on the bottom of this graph you can see mainframes and mini computers, personal computers and mainframes and mini computers, they're still there. It's always a bit of a surprise somehow that um, the numbers are not huge, they never have been huge, but they appeared around 1960 and they've stayed at effect effectively plateau levels. So it's not that those mainframes, desktops and minis have gone away, it's just that they've been superseded by much higher volume items which have come along over the top of it. It's also interesting to see that the uh, the professional versus consumer angle which goes up the left hand side there because of course inevitably as you move from things which are very specialist relatively low volume uh, activities to the higher volume then inevitably you're moving to a, a community of consumers so the average person in the street is the user of these computers whereas the professional would be the user of these other group now of course if we're talking about a platform for computing, then we're not just talking about a platform for computing professionals. We're talking about, in many ways, the business opportunity that it presents. And not surprisingly then, the business opportunity is the one which is ultimately going to dominate. As a result, the face of computing today, you'll see a lot of these things. Most of which you wouldn't recognize as computers at all. Of course, you're all technical audience. If I was presenting to politicians and so on, they wouldn't necessarily think of these as being electronic or electronic systems at all. They're just, well, a camera or a PC or a, uh, an MP3 player or a navigator or a washing machine. And of course, on top of that, there is the whole host of invisible uh, systems as well, the invisible aspects of computing. The energy systems over here, uh, security, wind power, robotics, uh, even cars. I like to put the cup of tea and the suitcase on there to remind us that uh, technology doesn't have to look like technology to be useful because a cup of tea is a logistical uh, masterpiece. You've grown a crop in a far part of the world, you've dried it and processed it and you've carried it across the, uh, across the world to the UK You've put it in the shops, you've bought it, you've taken it home, and you've got uh, China which has to be handled in the same way. And you've got things like a biscuit, and you've got the hot water, the energy necessary to heat it, all of which is essentially zero value. Nobody really appreciates it, and yet it's a logistical activity which is, which is supported in its achievement by these electronic systems which increasingly surround us. Now I'm not going to go into anything here which passes as maths, but it's really just to ask the question, what is a computer? Because if we're talking about computing machines, then we really ought to know this. We kind of all assume that it was those mainframes and the desktops, workstations, but we've already started to realize that there is a, a whole bunch of other things which are arguably computers as well. The only thing we can say about computing is it's a general term for algebraic manipulation of data data which might include state and time and data is an, exp an expression of a phenomena ranging from human thinking to calculations with much more specific meanings. Uh, it's certainly not prescriptive about the implementation technology and it's certainly not prescriptive about its programmability. So when we look back, as it's fairly easy to do, Antikythera 878 uh, BC was the first planet motion computer. That's, uh, that's the real one that was found in the Mediterranean. That's a computer simulation of what it is. It's a remarkably accurate calculator to predict the position of all of the planets and the moons that were visible in, uh, in ancient Greek days. And it was done, and if you think about it, it was done before metals were generally available. So metal was a very specialized piece of, uh, of material at that time and he was able to, somebody was able to, 
to work those bits of metal, but not only to work them into wheels, but to put gears around the edges of those wheels. It is a huge achievement. Probably the first early mechanical computer. Of course, going to the other end of the mechanical computer, Babbage's difference engine, 1837, um, was a calculation too far for mechanical technology. This was a computer to, to print log tables, and um, it was a, a marvellous piece of equipment, but actually it was beyond the capability of the machinery and the materials that they had in those days to make it. So it wasn't actually made until 2001. Of course, we have Baby as a computer. You wouldn't really recognize it as a computer these days. Nevertheless, it's got all of the characteristics of a general purpose computer. It uses valves instead of transistors, and it doesn't use very many of them. And that's not because valves were more efficient. It was just that it's a simple, very simple computer, and it was the first of its era. And of course, now, I'll put up a picture of a computer which you wouldn't really think of as being a computer at all. But nevertheless, it has in there analog electronics, digital electronics, software and memory. So it's got an awful lot of the, um, the things which are familiar with those, with the baby computer and with other computers. But of course, it also has a lot of other things. Uh, mechanics, mo motors, optics. Optics are a very big part of it. Sensors, displays, discharge tubes, robotic assembly a big part of it. Because a lot of this is so small that you can't assemble it by hand. Plastic, metal, glass, technologies, technologies which in some se senses seem to be already completed. Nobody does anything in glass anymore, do they? Well, actually, they do lots of things with glass anymore. Most people who've got an iPhone will be aware of the fact that it's got what they call buffalo glass on the front of it. Um, it's not just glass with a little bit of uh, difference. It's a different uh, chemical structure. And I think the, the significant point about this is what we have here is technologies which are working seamlessly together. And that's a, uh, an important thing to bear in mind, that technologies seldom happen on their own. They seldom occur on their own, and their use certainly doesn't happen frequently on their own. They're usually part of a product, and the product is the thing that people buy. And in this case, the people who buy it are a large chunk of the general public. And they buy it to enhance human memory. Because if you think about photography, that's what it's all about. It's about taking an image of something that you are experiencing and committing it to a perpetual media so that you can, you can look at it in the future, you can show it to other people, you can express it. It's a, it's a thing to enhance a human, some, uh, an important criteria to humans. And in fact, if you look at most systems that surround us, the things that we pay for are things which improve our lives. So things that are important to us, we're still animals, things that are important to us become things that we want to have. And so uh, a camera may seem like an odd thing to do, but, a, uh, but it enhances our memory. In the same way, an organizer, a diary, tells you when your meetings are, who you're going to meet, where you're going to meet people. A phone get, allows you to speak to other people at a distance. I mean, it's, these are all actually enhancements of, uh, of human life. We are becoming the $10,000 man. So putting technologies into context then. We know they're important. We know that our technology, whether it's hardware or software or, uh, or, or silicon technologies or whatever, are just technologies. They're one of the technologies which are in a product that the product has to work together to be sensible, then the thing we also have to bear in mind is that business has to happen. Um, businesses have to be money-making machines. There are transient phases in their lives when businesses may lose money, but generally speaking, if they're going to be around for a few years, they have to make money. They have to make money for their investors because investors are the people who put money into the business to allow them to deliver something, something that people want to buy, something that people want to exchange for their personal money. So you have to sell things that customers want. You have to focus on your core competencies and you have opportunities, competition, operations and investments which are increasingly global. So businesses have moved from being just a small shop on the corner to being a, a, a business in the global community, and that changes a lot of things. 
Businesses have to avoid commoditization. The last thing that businesses want is to become a commodity business. If I can buy the same thing from another company, then uh, the only difference between my company and that other company is price. So I don't really want to get into a war about price, and so I want to differentiate my product by, by giving it extra facilities, extra facilities that people discover that they want. It's interesting because people don't always know what they want, if, but if you present them with something in the product, a new feature, they will look at that and say, hey, that's cool. And if they, if they think it's cool enough, they'll pay money for it. They'll buy your product as opposed to other people's. But it is interesting to note that some people, a little while ago, started buying phones because of what they, what they looked like, as opposed to functionality. So Apple undoubtedly made quite a lot of success out of this. They have some very cool-looking products. Now that's separate entirely from functionality. It's down to people and their buying preferences. So with that in mind, you find that new products are both expensive and risky. So whenever you undertake a new product as a company, then you're facing a situation that um, you might go wrong. You might put a lot of money into this new product and uh, it might get to the market two months late it might uh, become uh, available in the market for 10% uh, more than you originally anticipated. Uh, it, it may be a little bit inclined to crash. All of those are risks which you don't want to encounter. And so whenever products, new products are designed, as far as possible, businesses will try to minimize the risk in doing it. So they want to do what they know how to do. They don't want to include new technology for the sake of it. They don't want to do new things because it's possible. They want to do what they know how to do because that is at least the more secure way of going forward. It means that technology then offers possibilities, but not all possibilities are good. So some possibilities uh, may incur an awful lot more cost associated with the outcome the value of which may not really appear to the, appeal to the customer. And of course the other thing they may do is they may incur extra risk in the sense that the, the product which was going to go out smoothly on a schedule is now going to be two months later. The consequence of which can be a missed market opportunity um, and, and frequently you miss your market window then you've, you lost 90% of the potential revenue from that market. So the value of new technology may not exceed the cost risk. And it's a thing to bear in mind that successful end products fund their entire value chains. So nobody, and that includes university lecturers and researchers and profs, nobody is outside of the value chain of products. If you're doing something which is valuable, then it contributes to the life cycle and it moves up the, up the food chain. And it needs to hit, at some stage, an exploitation channel. Because it's that exploitation channel that puts money back down the whole avenue. That's why you don't have any uh, problem getting your research funding, because people have seen that the outcomes from that group are valuable. And so it goes. So Moore's Law, then, is a technology opportunity. And I use this graph, and I'll point out that this is the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon, vintage 1999. It's old. Um, it's interesting from a couple of ways, but what, I'm using it here because it shows something that they never showed again. There's two curves on there, one of which is the, uh, the, the number of transistors going up per devices, the second one, the lower one, which I'll come back to in a moment, relates to productivity. But to put some scale on this, when ARM was started back in 1991, an integrated circuit had around a million transistors on it. A million sounds a lot. Today, we're looking at 20 billion transistors on an integrated circuit, which you buy for around three pounds. 20 billion. That's 20,000 times more capacity in an integrated circuit in 20 years, 20,000 times. One thing that's apparent with that is anything which is 20,000 times bigger than it was 20 years ago, you don't design it the same way. 
You can't just take the same approach of putting bricks on top of one another and cementing them together. When you're dealing with a few bricks, you can do it. When you're dealing with a skyscraper, you have to have a different approach. It means that methodologies have changed very significantly during that period of time, even though we may not realize it. The other thing was this productivity gap. And for today's talk, that's actually more interesting. Because back in 1991, it took around 100 person years to build that integrated circuit. And we did. We built it from the ground up. There was te a people, a uh, team of around 10 to 20 people working on various parts of that activity, the total efforts of which were around 100 person years. But the thing that it was significant here was it was predicting absolutely huge productivity gaps out in the early 2000s. And almost essentially, they didn't happen. Um, system chips should have been unaffordable by now. And that's the, that's the truth of the, the issue. Reuse is the thing which closed the productivity gap. And yet we still don't think of an awful lot of what we do as being good examples of reuse. Pre-1990 chip design was entire. More law, Moore's law was handled by ever bigger teams and with improved productivity. And I can remember a time myself designing a chip. I did it all on my own on a sheet of A0 paper and I knew I'd finished the design because I got to the bottom corner of the paper and I was drawing logic symbols with a pencil and simulation was by visual inspection. That was very different. Of course, pre post-1995, circuit blocks, CPUs and software. And I bring in software there because software is a great reuse tool. And what we're talking about is embedding software. You need an engine, but it enables you to focus a larger team on, a, uh, on an activity of getting out a product. External IP, so products where other people have been involved in the design and you've incorporated them. Uh, up integration, taking what you did last time and putting more things around the edge of it rather than starting all over again. Uh, chip reuse. Um, now, the, the essence of reuse, essentially, though, is you almost never start with a clean sheet of paper anymore. You always start with something that's gone before. And it's significant because despite the fact that this is history and, and, and known fact, we still tend to think in terms of let's start a new design. Let's start with a new methodology. Let's choose a new language. All of those things only work as long as you can incorporate the 90-odd percent of the design which has come from previous existences as well. You can't, of course, do any of those things without, a, without methodology. A methodology is a, uh, a bit of a Cinderella concept. Nobody loves methodology. And yet, without methodology, there is no way to stitch those blocks together. There is no way to bring in things from outside suppliers and include them in your product. You have to have the methodology. So methodology as an activity becomes significant. It delivers productivity, quality and reliability. And it delivers rapidity. It's the birth of the IP and know-how companies like Arm. And it led to the commoditization of silicon foundries and fabs. It's an interesting one to come to think about because those guys at one stage used to own the tools for designing the integrated circuits. Essentially, they own the route to the fab. What we've actually done in this era of reuse is we've allowed the world to design things. We've allowed people to become experts in certain areas and to contribute their, their element into the design. As a result of which, the fabs have just become manufacturing facilities, which is exactly what they are. And people can pass their designs from one of them to the other. The fabs have not become differentiated, they've become commoditized. And what happens when they're commoditized is they get beaten up on price. So the fabs are pursuing a route to larger and larger fabs because they have to work with tighter and tighter margins. But they've essentially lost control of the design uh, part of the task, which was a uh, significant value contributed to them. So some back of an envelope sketches just to give you some idea about how much reuse we do today. Mobile products have around 500 million gates of SOC and about 500 million lines of code. Numbers which are doubling roughly every 18 months. Uh, designer productivity on the other hand is still low. 
between 100 and 1,000 gates or lines per day, and I'm talking here about fully tested, verified, incorporated lines, so it's not how many lines you can write, it's a case of how many can get through the quality checks and so on. But that would mean a typical product designs only have around 50 to 200 person years of resource available. So this is a practical statement. I want to make a new product, how big a team can I bring to bear on this? And it's only a team of around 50 to 200 people in general which are going to design this new product. So that means that rather more than 99.5% of the design that they're going to be produce, producing has got to have been reused. It's just not viable to start again from a clean sheet of paper. It's a startling number though, because that only applies to the hardware and software. All of the other components as well, the I.O. systems, the audio, mechanical parts, the factories, uh, the business models. Seems, con seems strange to think that a business model is a component of a product, but it is. If you don't know how to sell the product that you've got, no matter how clever your product is, if you don't have the cash flow to make the volume that your customers need because they want to buy them in large quantities, then the business model and, de and deficits in the business model are just as good a reason for a product to fail as anything technical. So how do we reuse? Well, design tools, of course, are the classic way of, of handling reuse. And in fact, if you listen to the EDA industry, they'll tell you that's what reuse is all about. In point of fact, they're only focusing on a very small part of it. It's in their interest to tell you that that's what it's all about, but the reality of it is we use lots of approaches, actually. Uh, so we do reuse code and circuits, and we share methodology. That's an interesting one. Um, we share architecture. Architecture tends not to be one of those things which is talked about when you're designing a, a chip, and yet it's a very important aspect. Uh, creating tools to accelerate methodologies, repeatability, design for X, DFX, um, recognizing that your object, whatever your object is, doesn't exist in isolation, but it needs to be used, means that you have to think about how it's going to be used. So up the stream, how are people going to use this thing that you've created? Uh, because if they can't use it, they won't use it. And if they don't use it, the money doesn't flow back down to fund your activities. It matters. A significant part of it, however, is, and will remain so, knowledge-based. Now this is interesting because, generally speaking, people will tell you that tools, learn to use tools, use the tools. Tools do, is where you do the work. Actually, the human brain is the most wonderful tool that we've got between our ears, everybody has one. Use it effectively, it's the tool that stitches together all of the other tools. It is, it's the tool which gives you an answer when the other tools are not capable of doing it. A team has a wonderful collective experience as well because they are able to negotiate and, and discuss and consider their experiences and perspectives in ways that tools cannot. Don't underestimate this. You are the most useful tool in the, uh, in the toolbox. You are the most useful reuse component when it comes down to it. But it's, if you think about it in this context, the role of the design engineer, going back to that guy who produced the Antikythera, Antikythera 850 whatever it was BC, was to provide something that somebody wanted out of the technologies which were available. So he couldn't use electronics, he didn't have electronics, but he did have a wonderful new technology called metal. And he had this idea and he was going to create this, this solution using the technologies that has available. Now you have a different set of technologies available today and you will be called to solve problems. You will have some tools in this space and you will have your knowledge in your own head and you will be working no doubt in a team as a result of which you will be called upon to deliver an effective solution. It sounds easy actually, uh, but of course it's why being an engineer is such an exciting thing. <coughs> it's to create order out of chaos using current technology and knowledge to create a viable product. So we're good in the sense that once we, once we live with the idea that our role is secure, that there are tools and there are parts of our role that we can farm out and we can formalize and proceduralize because there will always be 
chunks of, uh, of what we do which are very specialized and only will be able to be done by, by us or other humans having suitable qualifications and experiences of course. The reuse platform then for productivity. Once we start to think in terms of reuse then we, th we start to think in terms of being able to, uh, to access other people's expertise and knowledge wherever it is wherever it is in the world, uh, however it fits in, because principally we want to focus on the thing that we're really good at, what we see as our value add. Uh, this, co this focuses businesses very much on their, their roles in life, and it also means that they get used to working with other businesses who are outside themselves, so outside, maybe in the same country, maybe in the same uh, nation, maybe in the world. Because an lot, awful lot of the expertise these days, facilitated by the uh, globalization of English language, uh, international contract law, I, good quality ICT, World Trade Organization, which allows us to buy and sell things around the world, IT and the internet, um, standardization of general purpose compute architectures. These are the six elements there. Which are, the, which are the basis of why international trade is now possible, and it's the basis of why we're able to use componentization as a uh, significant part of this reuse platform. It's a very different way of conducting business. It's never happened in human history before, and most people are in denial. Most people still think that businesses are like big versions of a corner shop. They have everything inside themselves. A successful business has design, it has manufacturing, it has shipping, it has uh, HR departments, all of the departments inside a big company. They still hold this up as the idea of what modern business is. Modern business that we're working in is not like that at all. People use expertise wherever it occurs outside the company. They bring it together and they have a strong in integrating influence. It's not just the technology companies like us. If you think of uh, people like Volkswagen doing cars, they have the cars manufactured all over the world these days. Used to be they were always only made in Germany. The design activities, they, they incorporate components from Bosch, engine management units and brake, uh, brake and stabilization controls. And they bring in that expertise to bring components into their products. It's not so unusual but we've got to look at it because it's not the same vertically integrated business it used to be. In the microelectronics business, then we, as a company like Arm, we supply intellectual property. So it's a virtual product. It's not even a physical product. We, it, we sell know-how and knowledge to people who are making um, integrated circuits or electronic systems, and we help them to get good productivity. We help them to get their product out on time, we help them to get to make them uh, to make their product quality. We also help them to reuse. They're able to take the designs which have gone before, the hardware, the software, and they're able to integrate it and up integrate it and evolve it as with as little pain as possible. That's a virtual product. It's not a physical product that you can buy and put on your parts list on your bill of materials, but it's something that they're prepared to pay for because it gives them productivity and time. So let's have a look at something which is familiar to us, the uh, uh, Moore's Law. We know that this exponent must end. Um, the growing opinion is 14, maybe 7 nanometer is the smallest node there will ever be. Think about that. So I've been in the microelectronics business for 40 odd years. It's something that I've always had as a background. There has always been transistors getting smaller. And now we're getting to the end. We really are getting to the end. We know we're getting to the end this time, although there was people who told us we were getting to the end at earliest, earlier times, all the way down from about one micron, in fact. But we know we're getting to the end now because we're actually bumping into the size of the atoms. And atoms are not getting any smaller. So we, we're going to have to accept the fact that uh, something, some sort of discontinuity is on the horizon. Uh, fortunately... It's on your horizon, not mine, because that exit door is a lot closer to me than it is to you. 
But I'm pleased to say that you're still going to be engineers and you're still going to be applying that now between your ears and you're still going to be coming up with solutions, practical solutions, from the available technology, from the technology which is available to you. Because that's what you do. Because that's what we've always done. That's what I've done. So it's only the things that are on the drawing board today that can get into the last of the planar chips. Um, the, it's also the end for clean sheet synthesis, scalable processor arrays, formal design, and top-down design. These are all um, fancies that have been around for quite a long time. People have been talking about them and the opportunities they present. Forget it. They've now gone. The opportunity to do clean sheet design or top-down synthesis on a brand new piece of silicon is pretty well gone. Uh, we now have to accept the fact that everything is evolved. So is it the end for Moore's law? Well, that was the last question. Let's look, however, at what's also going on around us. Look at this thing. iPhone is a pretty good example of, of what we're currently doing, and again, which we're tending to ignore. We're packing technology in very tightly. So it's not about just producing a chip anymore in which the entire system is. We know that it's got mechanics, optics, uh, acoustics and other, uh, other attributes. Those are all important features of the product and they have to be put in the product. It isn't a question of whether it all goes in the chip or not. It won't all go in the chip. It's not possible. Some of the things have to be external. The battery can't be in the chip. The, uh, the RF part makes a lot more sense to have separated. It's got the, this breadth of knowledge and experience as well as that requirement to, uh, to access the rest of the world for its delivery. Inside the control board, if you have any doubts about it, just look at the number of chips here. Uh, and the different technologies Non-volatile MOS, BIC MOS, uh, memory mo uh, MOS, analog MOS, saw filters. Um, we've got invisible stuff in there, OSs, drivers, stacks, applications, the GSM, security, graphics. There's a lot of stuff which is visible, a lot of stuff which is invisible. And it's packed onto this wonderful double-sided printed circuit board, tightly multi-layer printed circuit board. We've got gyroscopes in there, we've got um, GPS, which is analog CMOS, We're actually quite uh, testing analog CMOS as well. So a lot of technologies, in, uh, electronic technologies there. If you look at the A4 chip, which is circled at the bottom, uh, of course that's the A5 in a more modern version of the uh, iPhone, but even that isn't what it appears to be. A cross-section through the package tells you that there's two memory die and the processor die. So even in that package, which is only 1.4 millimeters thick, there is three die. The processor unit, remember I talked about uh, ARM having a million transistors when we first started? Well, this is a billion transistors. Um, a thousand, um, a thousand million transistors is quite a lot of an uh, activity. This particular one shows five ARM CPU cores. These are quite big cores as well. They're not the little ones that we offer. And I'll come back to that. There's an illustration here of, uh, like a block diagram of what's in the chip. The scale, of course, is still very much the same. Chips are always about that size. And that's one of the things that's caused the problem over the last 20 odd years is it may be 20,000 times more capacity in there but it still looks just about the same on the outside. Of course, when you start to delve down you realize that inside, at a sufficiently low level, are real transistors. That's the amount of interconnect necessary to connect up three real transistors and you've got close, close to a billion on that chip. So you can see the quantity of people who are infeeding their expertise into this is huge. Now Apple were put into a corner a few years ago and they were, they were accused of doing everything themselves uh, by the American government and so they produced this report which listed 159 tier 1 suppliers. So these are the people who are supplying technology to them for the final product assembly. This is represents thousands of design engineers, tens of thousands of engineers globally when you look at them and actually ARM is still not on the list 
because ARM isn't a tier 1 supplier, ARM is a tier 2 supplier. We supply into the people who are the component suppliers to Apple. You get your head around that, you realize how many levels there are in this game and just how worldwide this activity really is. So I would say that system packaging is maintaining the momentum. Uh, today, fairly simple stuff, but interposers and stacked die um, with hybrid technologies. And indeed, this Samsung memory device, which has actually got 24 layers in a true 3D integration structure, is an indication of where we're going. We can't make things flat and smaller anymore, but we can start to increase the, the, the third dimension. So I would take the view then that Moore's Law has been doing this for a little while. Um, that part of it is my era, the electronics era. We're now getting towards the top end of that era. And overlapping into this is now the electronic systems or the systems era. And I think it will run forward for another 30 years and I don't know what happens after that time. But also with the knowledge that, uh, that the Antikythera mechanism is actually older than Gordon Moore, then it's also reasonable to assume that this law of system functionality has actually extended all the way back down to the Stone Age. There's been engineers, they may not have called themselves engineers all the way back there, but people have been creating solutions to human needs since the beginning. It's just the technology which has changed. So what does ARM do? I'm conscious of my time, so I'm going to motor along a little bit. The basic concept of what ARM does is to take a simple RISC CPU and to make it available in a way which allowed it to be incorporated into an integrated circuit, like a Lego brick component. It was a simple idea, a difficult idea to live up to. But this chip here illustrates an important point. That was the first chip that we designed using this technique. It has a processor in it, it has DMA controller, PCMCIA, interrupt controller, memory interface. Didn't have any memory on board, didn't have any caches on board or anything like that. And the, the size of the CPU was 37,000 transistors. It wasn't big. That today is this, ch this chap back here. This has got five big processors on board. Not, not 40,000 transistors, but 50 million transistors. They're significantly different vehicles. And the designs that we offer as example designs go out to eight to, eight to 10 processors on chip. Those are, these are rather bizarre architectures. So here we've got a cluster of two high-performance CPUs and another cluster of two high-performance CPUs. And then somewhere down here we've got the GPUs and the MPEG engines, which are effectively processors as well. And then there's an interrupt controller and a hard, uh, uh, an LCD controller, which are intelligent in their own rights. They've got processors on board. So you can see that a, a chip like this has a lot of intelligence, huge amount compared to what we were doing in the past. It's no doubt, though, ARM is a platform to enable this kind of vehicle. But it's difficult to actually put your finger on what ways it's actually a platform. Because there's much more to it than actually giving the components and putting the components down on the chip. You've got to have the software tools, you've got to have the methodologies. How do you use a system which is architected like that, which the architecture looks decidedly odd, but has actually been constructed with a certain application space in mind. So you've got to have the way of expressing that architecture and the software to allow it to be, to be programmed and reused in that. And, and that is a significant part of the iceberg, the tip of which, you, which is visible from ARM as the CPU cores. We have around 900 global licensees and partners um, and of course millions of developers. But they're not developing for us, they're developing for themselves. But they've now shipped globally 50 billion ARM CPUs. Thank you, everybody, because you've been buying them from us. So that's good. Keep going. 50 billion. That's, there's only 8 billion people in the world, so everybody's, everybody's got one close by. I think the, uh, there was somebody who said that you're never more than 6 inches away from an ARM processor. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that one. The right horse for the right course. Um, of course, 
One of the important things that we have to do is to realize that it's not just about producing one CPU because different people have got different things in mind when they do it. So here we've got top-end processor, a large complex processor which has actually got four processing units built in it. And then over here you've got the Mali which is a DSP graphics processor. Again it's got lots of parallelism uh, incorporated in it. These are top-end CPU cells. Think of them as that. They're not chips in their own right, they're just cells to be used in a chip. At the other extreme, we've got this little fellow, which is the Cortex M0. He's 15,000 transistors, so he's actually half the size of the original ARM 7 CPU that we were putting onto the chip. He's used in all kinds of little things controllers, Bluetooth modules, uh, just Wi Fi interfaces, any, anything which needs a little bit of intelligence and smartness, not a huge amount of performance, but he's there. And the scale between those 50 million transistors versus 50,000 transistors, huge difference between these in terms of the physical size that they take on silicon, but also, of course, the application that they're aimed for. It means that there are 24 processors in our family. Most people would say ARM supplies a cell or a CPU, they don't realize that we supply 24 in the current six families. And these are processes which are not targeted to specific processes. So people who take these designs from us can take them to TSMC 60 nanometer, to uh, Global Foundries 20 nanometer, to IBM something. The, the product that we're delivering is knowledge and know-how. It's not fixed to a chip. We don't do any chips. All, pro all of our processors are born power efficient. Uh, it's just been part of our ethos for a long time. We anticipated that we wouldn't be able to get the highest performance chips, uh, and so we recognized that power efficiency was, was a, a greater opportunity for us, and so we focused on that. Um, power burning is a feature of hardware, but it's software that makes it happen. So parallelism turns out to be a good uh, scheme for improving power efficiency, and here we've got... Uh, examples of a single processor versus two processors in, uh, running the same thing in, in parallel. And you can see actually that there's better than 50% power saving by using parallelism. So our core link methodology which supports quad cores in parallel is a way of achieving higher levels of uh, power efficiency. This of course is an entire methodology to allow people to architect systems which are going to meet their needs. The big little processor, which you'll hear about um, in the press, is a combination of a little processor, the top one here, and a big one. They have the same instruction set, but one of them is optimized for power efficiency and the other one is optimized for speed. And the software is able to switch between the two dynamically, either by CPU migration or by multiprocessor. Moving on a little to the uh, application space, we have uh, around 130 people today are shipping development boards for A-class processors. These are the big ones capable of run running applications, complete with memory management systems. And at the same time, we've got around 40 or 50 people who are operating at the other end of things, a platform for the Internet of Things, and these are the ultra simple development environments to allow very simple controllers the, the like of which are uh, going to be used in Internet of Things type applications. Electronic systems will be a platform for society and I think this is an important thing for us to, to take particular note of. Um, every aspect of our lives in the future will be dependent on electronic systems. This is not electronic systems which are nice to have these are electronic systems which are keeping society running. So we've got to be involved in this thing. We can't opt out of it, but we have to recognize it. They won't solve society's challenges on their own, but they will be uh, fundamental to the solutions. I'm just going to go straight to the conclusion slide. To remember, please, businesses are about making money for investors. Good enough is enough. Perfection is for the gods. Platforms are just productivity aids. So the idea of a compute platform for the 21st century is kind of irrelevant. Platforms are about reuse and about reusability. And that, that has to be the thing we all ultimately remember. 
and electronic systems will underpin all of our futures. I've said that, but I think it's an important message for us to take away. Okay, and with that, thank you very much for listening, and I apologize for taking a little bit more than my time.